Hello, welcome to my garage. I'm Craig, and I like to work on stuff. Uh, a bunch of my friends asked if I would post some videos uh, online so that people could see a little bit more detail about the projects that I work on. So I thought I'd start with this steam locomotive. This locomotive was given to me by a dear friend who thought that I was the right guy for the locomotive, and so I'm doing my best to make that happen. This started life as a coal burner, and a lot of parks and museums that allow you to run miniature locomotives like this prefer a fuel source like propane because it's less of a fire hazard. So that was my project to convert this locomotive into a propane burner. So we'll just do a quick overview here. So a steam locomotive, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with how they work, uh, there's a firebox here where you would put fuel. So traditionally you would see on the, in the movies, they'd be throwing wood or coal into here and there'd be a hot fire going. And what happens is the gases from that fire cause heat to go through the boiler and that heat transfers to the water that's inside of this boiler. And that eventually boils and produces steam. So that's kind of the quick view of how a steam locomotive works. And there's a bunch of detail about how you want to do that some fuels are certainly better than others as far as producing that heat. But imagine uh, a tea kettle. If you leave a tea kettle on the pot for a certain amount of time, you get enough heat into it, you start to boil the water. Well, we're just harnessing the pressure of that boiling water in a container. And instead of it boiling and just flashing off like a tea kettle, it's going to be captured in the boiler until we open the throttle and let it out as steam. So that steam is going to go through these valves, which control how much and how long the steam acts on each side of the piston. And then when it hits here, it expands and it forces that piston to move, which connects the side rods, causes the wheels to turn. So there's a quick locomotive overview. So as far as the conversion to propane, I'm almost finished. So the locomotive itself is ready. I have some barbecue burners in there. There's six of them plus a pilot light and I can control the main six with this firing valve. This is an extension handle that goes down to a valve just below the deck, and that allows me to feed more or less propane into the fire. I also have a little pilot light so I can walk away for lunch, um, keep an eye on the engine from a distance, but it will essentially maintain the steam level that I adjusted at, hopefully. And so I had to work out all of this plumbing, which is an interesting thing because I wasn't familiar with national pipe thread and all that stuff. So I had to learn that system. Um, so I put together these fittings and they may look a little oversized, but that's because you don't want these lines to ice up. So you have to have to go a little bit out of the, the scale look in order to get the function that you need. So let me get this regulator out of the way and we can look. I added 45 degree fittings. So they have a nice arc to them. That will allow the engine and the tender to move independently because there's a drawbar way back in there so that the tender can move in curves. We have a safety valve there. So if things really get wrong, I can reach down and just hit that, shut everything off. And then we have a line that goes back to a fuel car. And so that's what today's project is all about. I have to find a way to haul this, I think it's a forklift propane tank behind that locomotive and make it look good. So I think I can do that with the ideas that I've, I've got and some of my friends gave me additional ideas that are going to make that look really nice. So let's go over to the one that we're working on. So the concept is to have a flat car. And I didn't want an excessively long flat car because I only have to haul that tank, which is maybe two, two and a half feet. So I started building this shorty flat car. You can see the wheels, the truck sets are fairly close together. And then a friend of mine said, well, why don't you make it look like a steam locomotive tender that has been repurposed for this use? And I really like that idea because it gives it a backstory. And this would be really common for particularly smaller railroads who can't afford to just go buy new equipment all the time. They would take, for example, a steam locomotive that had been in a wreck and was scrapped or a tender whose, whose water tank rusted out and was no longer useful for that purpose and they'd reuse it because there's a perfectly good frame with wheels and everything. So naturally you would you could convert that to haul that little propane tank over there. Of course, in real life, it would be probably a water car or something like that because they generally 
wouldn't burn propane for the old logging locomotives. But in this case, I think it'll serve the purpose. So, so I added this footboard at the back and that makes it really look more like a tender. Let's go over to the, the other one here and you can see the back of this tender has one. So I used that as kind of my template so that they would look good together. So we'll have this locomotive with its tender, a fuel line, the secondary fuel tender, and then on the back of that will be another footboard. And that also makes sense if you were on full scale doing switching with these, it gives the, the brakeman or conductor a convenient place to ride so that they can access the air hoses and, and uh, the cut levers and things for doing their switching jobs. And you'll notice a lot of switching locomotives and loggers also have that footboard in the front for the same reason. So let's go back over here. I've just finished cutting all of the wood decking. This is all uh, shipping pallet. It's oak pallet. And if you look carefully, there are most, most businesses that do a lot of heavy freight will have a pile of shipping pallets out front. And just pick through them and you can see the distinctive grain of the oak. And sometimes it's harder because these are the saw teeth marks. So some of the teeth were a bit out of alignment and left these marks. But I really like that look. But if you look through that, you can still see the oak grain. So if you can find one and you can manage to tease the thing apart because the nails are very difficult to get out, um, without splitting them all, then you can use these for this function. I really like the look. They have a little bit of grade weathering on some of them and they're all a little bit different. So I, I kind of randomized the color and texture patterns throughout the car. And once I get these varnished and screwed in with some, I've got some stainless carriage bolts here. Let me dig one of these out. So these, you'll see these bolt heads. There'll be two per end. I think it's really going to look nice. And in fact, I've done this before, so I'll show you what the finished decking will look like. This is the same material. This is a flat car that I built, I guess, last winter. Little container for safety items and, and backpacks and whatever back there. And then it's hard to see, but this is a really nice cushy seat. And then here's the backrest. And you can flip that backrest over if you change direction. You just flip it the other way and sit in the seat the other direction. And those all, that index is in these stake pockets here. So the seat is secure. It can't move. There's also a footrest. So your feet can perch up against that. This seat would be over on the backside there. So you can stretch your legs and perch on that seat. So that gives you an idea of, of what we expect for the finish once we, we get that oak all finished up. This flat car is one that I built out of scrap material and it has a functional truss rod under it. So you can adjust that truss to give this more or less arch depending on the weight that you're carrying. And uh, it was kind of a fun project. I also used the Milwaukee Road logo and modified it for my company, which is a great time for a plug for Pacific Journal Pad LLC. So what my company does is we make journal lubricating pads. So if you look at a vintage rail car wheel for example one of these and let's go over to the axle there's a lid and if you were to open that lid you'd see the end of the axle and underneath it would be a little cellar with a bunch of oil and a pad and that's what we make is that pad turns out no one else wants to make them or knows how or cares so we uh we made some as a test and it got popular and pretty soon it became a business. So um, we're the, I think, as far as I know, the last maker of journal lubricating pads in America, possibly even other countries, because we've gotten orders from England too. Anyway, the function of that product is to wick the oil from the bottom of the cellar up against the axle. And as it rotates, it wipes the oil on and it carries it up into a bearing, which would be just above the axle that bears the weight of this corner of the truck. So there's the plug, we'll get on with the other things. So let's go back to this flat car, talk about some of the details that I added. So in addition to this footboard, we have different coupler pockets. So this is a standard height for most of the, the railroad equipment that I run here. It's um, I think about four and a half inches on center of the coupler. There's also an option to go higher. Uh, some people who run narrow gauge equipment at a larger scale have couplers that are taller. So if I ever wanted to put this in one of their trains, I could do that. 
Some other details include more stake pockets. So if I ever wanted to mount a, a seat here, it would be awfully short, but you could potentially put a rider on here if you didn't have a fuel tank on it. Uh, also handrails. So these are just little pieces of round stock that I bent in the vise. And the trick that I learned is when you bend them, do them all at the same time, put them all in a row and bend them. So they all come out to the same distance on center. And then when you go to drill the holes for mounting them, you can, you can just set up a template and drill all the holes the same and they'll line up. On this other end, this is the end it, that would go against the locomotive tender. And you can see it has three coupler pockets because the tender of that locomotive has an especially low coupler height. I think it's, it's three inches and in change. So, so this car also allows me to interface that with any other trains. It's kind of like an adapter so I can mount it there. If I decide I want to run this separately from the locomotive, like behind the electric goose or something, then I can use this other option. And I also chose to model this handbrake. There was a steam donkey on a flat car up at Mount Rainier Railroad, which is where I volunteer and, and work part-time on full-size steam equipment. And there's a bunch of stuff up there with some great history. And, you know, there's you can see the, the history because it's got patina from accidents and logs getting out of hand and it's just wonderful to look at and and it's neat for modeling details so the prototype would have let's see if we can zoom you in here there we go so there's a little where'd my finger go there it is there's a little ratchet here that engages with this geared wheel and that winds up on this little pulley or this this drum so around that drum would be a chain and that chain would go back under the car to the brake linkage and and in this case these cars don't have brakes generally at this scale unless they're really heavy so this is all for looks but i really enjoy these kind of details so you would you would engage the the little ratchet assembly and start cranking on this handbrake and it would wind up that chain and eventually tension the brakes under the car it's just a fun little detail some other details, these these trucks came with the steam locomotive. There's a set of, I think, six of them that I got with it. So I chose to use those for this car. These are called arch bar trucks. And this was really common for logging and mining type railroads. They're, they're fairly lightweight um, and you can work on them. You can assemble them in the field. If you have an accident or a wreck or something, you can take them apart and repair damaged pieces. The, the alternative would be a full cast side frame, which are much heavier. And, and if you get in a wreck with that, it's just going to break. And so then you end up replacing it. But with arch bars, they're a little bit more, more repairable because they're modular construction. And so you can see they're taking advantage of this triangulation and these cords to form the stretch, structure and strength that you need to support the weight. So... All of the weight is going to come down the center of the car through what they call the bolster. And then this is going to ride on these springs. So there's your sprung suspension. And if, if I were to get on this table and sit on it, you'd see those springs compress. And then that, that weight is then carried through these triangular shapes to hang on the axles. So that's the function. The other nice thing about arch bar trucks is they're a little bit more flexible than a cast steel truck. So they can help conform to some irregularities that maybe a more solid truck wouldn't be able to. Um, and I just like the design because I'm so used to seeing these on particularly logging locomotive tenders that it just made sense to use these wheels. And, and the price was right because I already had them. So my setup on the drill press is this. I have a template on top that I've already drilled my four corners and then I've got two pieces clamped underneath. So I should be able to hit consistent spacing for every one of these that I drill. So I'll do two of these and I'll clamp two more to the template and continue until I finish the decking on the flat car.
Okay, I have all the boards cut to length. I've got the edges sanded, especially the ends, because I don't want to have any splinters. It's, it's not so critical to sand these areas, but I also did those a little bit, just kind of knock the corners off. Uh, but it's really important that nobody gets splinters here. So I sanded that and then kind of rounded these corners. And then a little bit of surface sanding here just to take off some of the roughest stuff. And it's okay that they're not all the same height because that would be prototypical on a flat car. You'd have various boards that were replaced over the years or they warp or cup differently or whatever. So I also relieved the middles so I have access to my pin. So there's a bolster pin and a coupler pin on each end. So I just used a large step drill and went up to the diameter that I needed to clear that that pin. So my next step, I know that these are probably going to be a little bit more stable when I varnish them, but they're still going to pick up moisture and they can expand and, and contract. So my experience with the last flat car is that when I put the boards on, they were still a little bit wet. They weren't soaking wet because I let them dry out for a while, but they ended up shrinking a little bit from when I installed them. And so the gaps opened up, which is a good thing. Because if it went the other way, if they swelled when it was in there, that could create big problems. You could have enough force to, to bend or shear the mounting bolt. So what I've done here, after I sanded them, I found out that there are already some gaps here. They're not super wide, but I think it's enough that it's going to work. So my idea is I'm going to start with each end and get the ends mounted flush, attach those, and then work my way in and try to try to just even the spacing up as best I can so they have a little bit of breathing room. And then once I get all the, the fasteners drilled here, um, I'll sort of put screws in as I go to hold the place and then move the next board up against. When that's all done, I'll pull the screws back out and then I'll start the varnish process on these, which is maybe two or three coats, I would think is enough. Um, they're durable enough. The oak is a hardwood, so it's super durable. And if it gets scuffed, I can sand it or just throw another coat of varnish. So I'm not too concerned. I just want to kind of stabilize them so they don't soak up a bunch of moisture if this gets caught in the rain. And the varnish gives it kind of that dark look that I'm that I want to make it look aged. So that's what my thought process is. So I'll update you in a minute. Okay, you can see my setup. I've got a couple clamps to hold this. Once I get the first screw in on each side, then it should hold the position well enough that I can get the second screw after I remove the clamp. There we go. We'll wipe that clear. And for those that aren't familiar with these type of carriage bolts, see how they have a square just under the round head? The purpose of that square is to engage the material on this side so it doesn't spin as you're tightening the nut from the bottom. So I'm not gonna pound those in just yet. I'm gonna wait until the final install, but I'm just gonna put that there. Um, I think these are a little bit tougher on these corners because I have a weld that goes under here. So um, it takes a little more force to drill through it. But let me get the other side. And you can see the suspension working when I push on this. So I have to be careful not to let it slip. And of course, I'm wearing safety glasses because uh, you can't drive a car or locomotive if you can't see. It just doesn't work so well. So um, any of you who think you're too cool for safety glasses, think about that when the next time you go for a drive. Okay, there's my public safety announcement. All right, let's do the other side here. And uh, yeah, you can see that that locates it fairly well. So 
So let's drill the second one. There we go. Now we're getting it. And back around to this side. I'm sure there are more efficient ways to do this. If I had a giant drill press, I could probably knock these out in no time at all. Yeah, drill motor is running out of power, but we got it. So that's the basic idea there. So when it's time to set these, actually that hole is a little bit bigger than it should have been because it's dropping down. But the way you do it is you take a hammer and you bonk these things and it sets that square piece down into the wood. And it should be just enough grip that you can run up and tighten them. If that doesn't work, you could get on them with a, a vice grip or something and try not to mar the ends up. But in general, we're not um, tightening these so tight that they're going to spin all over anyway. You could probably just hold them with your thumb and run the nut and washer up the bottom side. So that's the general idea. Um, I'll leave the camera here, but I won't make you suffer through this whole thing. Okay, we're getting down to the end. I kind of figured out a system that, that seems to be working well. I drill the two exposed holes and then put the bolts in. And then I can shift the clamps down to the next two, get my alignment, and lock those in place. And I kind of leapfrog the clamps. So I've always got something under the clamps kind of holding everything in position while I'm working. And that keeps us from fighting sort of having these climb up the drill bit because these if, if you get a little sideways there's a tendency for the board to climb up the bit so these are located with these and I kind of put my hand on it and drill when I go to these the clamps hold them in place and they just leapfrog so I've been splitting the gaps um, some of them are touching but then I've left some gaps where the the boards need some space in case they need to expand um, and I'm, I'm really happy with how this is turning out. So I'll keep working. I'll leave the camera running so you can watch me struggle for a little bit. You probably get entertainment out of that. And I found that if I reach across the car, and brace it with my elbow, I can counter the, the weight that I'm putting on this end so it doesn't tip so much. Uh-oh. Easy. There we go. Oh, we're falling apart. There we go. Okay reestablish this clamp it decided to take a vacation or a field trip i guess okay let's make sure i'm not doing any precision measuring on these boards because a railroad would not do that generally they they just need a decking on here to hold the cargo so i'm just kind of feeling the edge and going well that's about right seems pretty even done it again well just stay there we don't need your help now anyway I think my battery's losing its life but 
thankfully they're rechargeable. Okay, two more to go. Home stretch. Come on. There it is. Okay, last one. Let's try not to break the drill bit. Come on. And there it is. So those look pretty good. You can see they're fairly linear. We don't, we don't have zigzags or any of those kinds of things. On the last car, what I did is, is set a straight edge here and made a little marks, but then I had to go back and erase all of the pencil lead before I did the varnishing. So in this one, let's see if I have it handy here. I do. I made a cardboard template. Can you see that? There it is. I made a cardboard template taking into account the fact that I didn't want to be too inboard on here because uh, the fasteners would run into this flange. So putting them closer to this edge makes it easier to reach around. And so this just goes around there. I made a pencil mark, made one template, and then I clamped that to two more and then continued to use that as my template all the way down. So I should have pretty consistent hole spacing. They may not necessarily be interchangeable due to the irregularities in in the edges and that may change spacing between boards but within the board they're, they're pretty close so i did number them we've got numbers there so when i varnish them i can put them all back in this orientation i don't have to do any guessing so i try to outsmart myself by doing things like that because otherwise i'd forget uh what else do we have going on here i think we're uh we'll do a little bit more sanding i'd like to clean these up a little bit and uh get some varnish on here here's another little life hack that i've learned when i have a project and i've got all my fasteners laid out rather than putting them over here where they're gonna fall off the edge of the table or something i use these little trays this is from uh frozen indian food so you get sog paneer or, or uh what's the other one lamb masala or something like that and I wash these out, and they make wonderful little compartments. In fact, you can see a little anti-seize smeared on there from another project, things like that. So what I do, I pop all the fasteners out, put them in here, and then when I'm ready to reassemble this part of the project, I've got everything where I need. So I guess a, a place where I learned that was on the car that you can't see right there. It's the 38MG. Check out my other videos on that. Uh, I would do a sub-assembly, and then I'd go, you know, two weeks later, I'd get back into it and go, where did I put those fasteners? I know I laid them out. So, um, you know, if you want to get real crazy, you can put a piece of tape with a real label, but we don't, want to, we don't want to go that far here. So, anyway, that's a little life hack. If you haven't tried it, sometimes it can save you a lot of grief. So we're going to put these in there, and we're going to wipe up all of this metal shaving, get everything clean. And then I'm going to prep this tabletop, probably with some butcher paper, and get ready to varnish. I'll probably lay some, some wooden stickers that allow me to do the bottom side, and then lay it on the bottom side, and then hit the top side so I don't have to wait between coats to do both sides. I've also heard that people enjoy watching other people drag out tasks to impossibly slow work rates. And, and so I'll give you a little bit of that while you watch me undo all these fasteners, if that's what you're into. If you're not, you can skip ahead. It doesn't bother me. Okay, so I'm going to stack all these up and uh, we'll clean off this frame. If I had my vacuum handy, I would use that, but... 
one of my pet peeves. I hate dragging shop vacs around the shop. It just, it's always a, a problem for me. So maybe that means I've got the wrong tool for the job. But anyway, I'm just going to wipe these and I'll vacuum up later. So there's the proof that, uh, you know, my system isn't perfect. You can see there is variation. Some are a little closer to the edge than others, probably because when the drill goes down, you know, the wood isn't going to guide it perfectly level. This doesn't bother me at all because I have them numbered. No big deal. If it was really a problem, I could always sort of enlarge the holes on the top board. Um, it's, it's not a super critical situation where these, these uh, square heads have to engage perfectly. So um, for what we're doing in the scope of this project, that'll be just fine. Um, here you can kind of see the assembly for the truck frame and the bolster. These happen to be part of this truck set, and I didn't actually need them to be this long, but they're hidden, and I thought it, at some point, point I may need extra reinforcement here so I left them as part of the assembly and welded them in place uh, they don't hurt anything that's for sure and, and if anything they add a little extra weight so that's kind of where I'm at on the structure of this setup it looks like I have I do have to do one more pin because this guy's a little short so I'll show you that on the metal lathe when I get around to it all these are they started out life as these Three eighths, I think they're three eighths bolts. Um, so I, I start off in the three jaw chuck and I round this off and, and then thin it down to make a nice round head as such. And then cut it to length, whichever you can use a parting off tool and then round it off and then cross drill for a little, uh, little hairpin or a cotter pin. And that's all it takes. So I've, I've been making all my own pins for the the bolsters and the coupler things it's it's cheaper than going out and buying a bunch of stuff so um that's one way to save money on these kinds of projects okay let me clear this thing off and i'll get back with you let's talk a little bit about strategy here so if you've ever painted stuff you know that you know you got to paint one side and then flip it over and paint the other and there's a couple ways you can do that you can paint the one side wait for it to dry flip it over and paint the other but what I'm going to do here, I really don't care that much about the finish on the bottom side. I want to get some varnish on there to protect it, but it's we don't care if it's got some lines in it. So what I'm going to do, I've got them upside down now. I'm going to do the bottom side, and then I'm going to flip them over, and then do the top side. So when it dries, there'll be a little bit of a mark here from where it rests on these little stickers. But the top side is what we really care about. We don't want a big streak running down the whole flat car. Well, it appears that I have just enough of this to get the job done for at least one coat. It was nearly empty and there was kind of a skin in the bottom, so I might be picking little chunks out of it. But I think we've got enough to, to have a go at it. So let's start on it and I'll kind of show you what I'm doing. I'm using an old brush that's been used before and uh, I'm afraid that brush isn't going to get it done. So let me grab a new brush. Okay, now we got a better brush. If you don't have flex in the bristles, it's kind of hard. So we're going to be on the bottom side here and just kind of work my way down. It's going to soak up quite a bit of this stuff initially. And that's okay. We want it to try to penetrate the wood. We also want to think about the sides. Um, I want to give them a coat. So I'm going to leave myself a little handle on one end and then I'll get all the sides and then I'll do the end up and then flip it over. Oh, and you can see, we'll come in a little closer. See the difference between the, the varnish and the not varnish. It just gives it kind of that darker, more aged look. And with more coats, that'll be even more pronounced. So yeah, it's really using up a lot, but I like how it looks. And then this is kind of neat. You can see the oak grain really comes out nicely there too. Oops, got ahead of myself. Let's get these sides done first. In my younger days, I probably wouldn't have worn gloves and I'd try to be Mr. Tough Guy, say, oh, I don't need gloves. But the longer you live, the more you would realize you're lucky to still be alive. There's a lot of ways to 
to not make it to your next birthday. And so as you get older, you start to think about, you know, maybe I should protect myself and go for another year. So, so I'm wearing gloves today and you know, that's your choice. Safety's up to you, really, even at, at a workplace, it's, it's really on you. So I always encourage safety. I, I worked at Weyerhaeuser in research and development. They had a great safety program and the number of injuries that I had at home because of that were much fewer. Far less skin knuckles because that voice in your head says, you know, why don't you put on a glove before you run that angle grinder? And uh, safety glasses, things like that. So, okay, so now the bottom is done. So let's flip it over and I got the sides. We're just gonna flip it over and we'll hit the top. We may only need a couple coats because this is really laying down nicely. Yeah, I like the I like the grain patterns and I like the saw blade marks. You can see where where they ran this through a saw mill, and some blades or some blades, maybe not the new ones, but the old ones at least had interchangeable teeth. You could pull an individual tooth out, sharpen it, and put it back on. And that may be the case with these. I'm not familiar with modern sawmill designs, but you can see where the teeth have sort of swiped around so one tooth probably stuck out a little more than the rest every time it went by maybe more than one tooth if it's a big blade it would leave a little bit deeper cut in the wood and i just think that's really cool it's sort of a shows you nobody's perfect that's for sure you know another thing if we're talking about safety i need to open the garage door and get a little draft going because uh, the fumes are not exactly good to breathe on this stuff. I do like the smell, but I don't, I don't smell it on purpose. It just, the smell of this stuff reminds me of a, the smell of a finished project, which is kind of exciting. This is, this is the most fun for me, is when you get to this point where you start to see, you know, that your, your, your idea might work. That's kind of fun. So, there's, there's a couple of little metal flakes I'm seeing here, but what I did is I tried to brush off as much as I could. When I was drilling these, of course, this was the bottom against the wood, and the metal, as I was pushing, would kind of grind itself into the wood. So I've tried to remove most of that to clean things up. It's not the end of the world if there is some in there, but it may leave a little rust mark, and that may not be the end of the world either. You have to remember, this isn't fine furniture. I, I don't do fine furniture. This is a, a flat car designed to carry freight, and these things get banged and beat up. They get cargo thrown on them, dropped on them. You can only imagine what happens in railroad service with this stuff. They get banged around in switch yards and all kinds of stuff. If I had time lapse, that might be a cool thing, but I don't have time to figure that out. I have a lot of projects going on between this my business, my music schedule, the railroad, full-size railroad, the live steamer stuff. There's just a lot going on. So someday maybe I'll figure out the time-lapse thing. I'm sure one of you viewers probably could show me in 30 seconds, but uh, today that's not going to happen. And that's okay. Okay, we're making progress here. Probably going to run out of memory on my phone in a minute, but I'll just do this one more board and then you can imagine me doing all the rest. I'm sure that's not hard to imagine. Maybe if we're lucky, the neighbor cat will visit. There's a giant orange cat that lives just up the road. Sometimes he stops by and says hi. Well. Actually, he hasn't said hi yet. He usually says meow or something to that effect. But, um, you know, if he did say hi, I think he'd make the cover of Time Magazine or something. He'd at least go viral on the internet. I've been working on my cats. We have two cats, uh, both orange cats that we adopted this year. Um, trying to get them to use their words, but so far 
we've got we've got meow and morale and sort of a mooing sound when they're too lazy to open their mouths so still not not getting words or sentences um, one can only try okay I almost forgot I need to get some varnish in these holes for the pin so I'm just gonna slather it on and you know what if it runs down on the bottom side no big deal I'm sure the the woodworkers and furniture builders out there might have something to say but that's that's all right you can you can do that on your own project okay that is looking good okay I promise you I only do one more so you cut you off there um, I'll give you an overview once I get the, the rest of them finished Okay, we're all finished. Got the last one varnished up. Now I'm cleaning my brush. We'll go on a little field trip here. Okay. I don't know if you guys remember Bob Ross. He used to paint happy trees. We learned a trick from him long ago to clean the brush off. So this is a tribute for Bob Ross. So there we are. We're going to let these dry probably at least overnight because it's fairly cold right now. Um, check them, see how they're looking tomorrow. And then I think I have just enough in that container to do another coat. And that might be enough for what we're doing here. So I'll keep you posted. Oh, before we go, let's go over here and talk a little bit about how I constructed the frame. Kind of going in reverse order because I didn't think to make a video until somebody asked. But the way I did this is I started with my center spine and I decided how wide I wanted it. I also had to make a decision on how to do these seams and the way these work, if I can find it, this piece, uh, traditionally I would cut a 45 degree bevel, but I've had problems when I weld those. Sometimes it cools and it doesn't form a really nice 90 degree angle. And the reason that is, is because you know, if you go to weld on the inside and it cools, it might pull it together a little further. And then you go to weld the outside while well, it's already out of square. So what I did here is I did an overlap where this piece, I relieved the flange like that so that the flange on this one could overlap. And, uh, and that worked out pretty well. And then um, on the end here, you can see that's that's the line that I cut right across there. And so that allows this side piece to come in like that. And then when I did my welding, I tacked it on the edges and then came in and did a full bead across there. And so that helps it sort of stay square when, when everything's cooling. If you just go run a bead of weld on one side, it's gonna, gonna pull it. And even, even in a flat plane, you know, let's say I wanted to put a bead on that seam on the top. If I just ran a bead and then left it, as the bead cools, I'm gonna have a big V there. And so I have to think about those kinds of things when I put these together. It's still not the end of the world because after all, this is a, it's a little flat car on little mini train tracks, but I, I wanna do the best work I can and put some of the things I've learned to use. So that was the construction for these corners. For the ends here, they're just butted up against and I welded a bunch on the inside. I left the weld off here. There's no reason to weld both spaces because there's plenty of surface area underneath to weld. And once I got the basic structure together, um, I was able to double check my height for couplers. So I put this on rail and then I measured from the rail up to the center line of the couplers to make sure everything was right. And, and that allows me to figure out the shimming and the height that I needed here to get everything to finish correctly at the right heights. And then when that was all done, I went in and added these counterweights. There's, they're just big flat bar steel, not really counterweights, I guess, just weights. That's the best term for that. Just pieces of half inch by two flat bar welded underneath. And it really gives it some sturdiness. It gives you um, more pressure on the wheels. So they're less likely to derail in uh, situations where you run through a, str a spring switch or a, or unusual track. And then these end, the footboards, I just measured the material 
on the front of the locomotive or on the tender. I think they're identical on there and found some scrap material in my pile. And then I bent these brackets at a 90 degree angle and I put them all in the vise next to one another. So when I bent them, they all came out more or less the same dimension. Um, I still haven't tightened them on here, so they're, it's a little bit wiggly, but um, once I got them bent, then I used a, a square to make sure that every dimension was square. So I had a, a 90 down here and that 90 didn't like run off this way or that way. It's, it's square and true in every dimension. And then when you bolt that up, it just looks right. Every, everything's nice and true. And then once I got everything in position, I welded these little kickboards here. And, uh, and then I had pre-drilled these. So then all I had to do is transfer punch through those holes to find the center of where the mounting holes would be, drilled those through and mounted everything up. So I think that's about it for now. Keep you updated, final assembly, things like that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more interesting things around the shop. We've got a, a Porsche 356 project car. We've got the race car, another fun car there, a couple more fun cars over there. We've got a steamer. I have some things I want to do there. I'm working on cab lights right now, and once those are finished, I think it will be more or less ready to run. Uh, we, could, we could also talk more about the goose if, if there's not enough information in those videos. Um, we could talk about... How to build these rolling racks. These are racks that I built uh, using basic bridge technology with the triangulation uh, and makes a really nice work platform and storage for, for your rolling stock. So I think that's about it now for now. Um, we'll talk to you later.